start our session, right? Thank you. So, as I mentioned, uh, we're just here to bring design and creativity across, you know, to everyone, to be honest. Uh, think of a marketeer, think of a business person, think of a techie, right? Who can use uh, design for positive impact in their day-to-day -day job. And obviously designers as well, from every discipline and aspect of design. In the future, we aim to empower a community of curious minds who understand the design and, you know, can basically have their own ways and own framework and methodology to apply it as a thought process and to be critical thinkers um, as a skill, to be honest. Now, delivering empathy, uh, imagination and user driven products and cycles. All in all, it's a design and it's a community for designers and non designers altogether, right? So before we move on, <laughs> uh here's we who we are right uh we have a bunch of uh, creatives with us uh i'm a product designer i'm ronak um we have devangana who is a visual designer we have tit uh, who is a ey designer and uh, we have city who is also a product designer phoebe a product designer as well and radhika the co-founder of this community a service designer uh we aim to offer uh, apart from this uh, speaker sessions uh we aim to offer things like uh workshops like short interactive sessions right uh, and boot camps where we get a lot more interpersonal and in depth, uh, where you can learn and devise new ideas, new skills, hone them. Uh, we have our academic and career talks where you know we bring in alumni, where uh, you can uh, they address your concerns about a design career, and where you can you know help you, you can get into the talks with them, and help yourself build a sustainable career in design. We have get-togethers which are like short, quick, you know sessions for networking and making friends all across design community and end of all we have our own discord community and slack channel as well we'll share a keyword link with you on the next slide just you know if you want to join our community it'll be really fun we'll all work and grow together so i'll give you a moment to you know uh, take a screenshot or just uh, you know pull out your phone and scan the QR. you can join the discord community directly Okay, uh, I'll move on then. Hope you got it. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll share the link uh, in the description um, overall for the Discord community. Um, before we start the session, just remember, you know, if possible, keep your cameras on. It, you know, helps us bring us all together and make us feel like we're part of the team. And you know, you can if you have any questions, uh, drop them in the chat after the you know the talk is done. Uh, uh, you know, we'll try to address all of them. Um, and overall, you know, just have fun. So we have Yovan with us today, who is a you know head of technology at Station in Singapore. We're talking about uh, how we can use design to craft business and business concepts and improve execution design decisions, right? Um, like basically from design to execution and everything all everything in between, right? Uh, it's an all-encompassing talk. It's going to be a very interesting one. So, um, you know. Uh, I'll just like to welcome you to the talk and um, you know, to WDP and without any further ado, you know, I'll just pass it on to him. Yovan, Yovan, whenever, Yovan. Hey guys. All right, let me share my screen. Give me a second. Uh, pull it up. All right. Cool. Can everyone see my screen? All good. All right. Perfect. Hey guys, it's nice to meet everyone here. Uh, thanks for joining this call. Uh, today, yes, I want to talk a little bit more about how we can take design and achieve better executions from maybe, you know, building your own startup or even the next product within your company, right? So the different techniques I'm going to show, I'm going to also talk about some of uh, some methodologies that we can use to help improve, um, you know. I want to keep this section as interactive as possible. So do jot down your questions if you have any, and then you, know, you can blast them at me right at the end. Um, a little bit more about me. So I graduated actually in game design development, and I do nothing related to 
building games or developing games. So I very quickly after I graduated from game design, I went into more on the technology side in general. So I started working in the banking industry first. And then from the corporate industry, I went into a more startup like industry. So I've been in startups since the past two years where I launched my first startup. And then very recently, uh, I've launched my next startup uh, along with my co-founders called uh, Station. So Station is a co-working space platform where you can go on, book a co-working space, kind of find spaces for your companies, for yourself, whatever your needs are. So if you're looking for a space, let me know. We can talk more about that later on. Um, if you have more questions about my background, uh, feel free to you know, scan the QR code, connect with me, or even check out my company and see what we do and how we can help each other in that sense. So let's dive a bit into the topic, right? But before we really get into the nitsy and gritty of the topic, I want to talk about some of the misconceptions that people have about design. Uh, a lot of time, I think uh, since the past 10 years, design has always been taught of a motor skills and not a cognitive one, right? If you go to a, um, uh, many of the corporate industries over here, uh, you know, uh, especially if you talk to a few generations ago, design is, they would either think of it as some form of UI UX design, or they would just think of it as some artistic skill, right? But design has evolved over the years. Design has become more of a business tool. It has become... Uh, uh, methodologies and even a cognitive one where people use to make decisions in the business world as we scale. So some of the common things that we see people think about design today is, you know, one uh, one of the biggest things even I face uh, in, in my past experience is that a lot of C-suite or management tend to hate the word design. When they hear design, they think it's, you know, uh, a fluff word or a cost a cost what it's just an expense in the balance sheet right at the end of the day and and you see that changing today we see that changing especially with you know uh people go, uh, getting more educated with more de what design is all about schools including uh design uh based uh learnings into their their, their overall uh, you know courses so and a lot of times people think design don't equal, doesn't equal money, right? It thinks it's always a, a way to get people to get better UI and that's it. So that's the kind of views that we see in the industry today. And a lot of the time they think design can't be forecasted. As you know, in every business, we forecast our sales, we forecast our profit and loss statements. But how do we forecast design, right? How can design really make a difference in your forecasting when it comes to the business sense of things. So that's something we need to talk about to really kind of change the, the point of view of design and how why people think of it that way. Uh, so why do management hate design, right? So it's, it's a mindset shift, right? Uh, people associate the word design a lot of the times with what I was speaking about pre, uh, previously. But if you really dive deep into it and you do your research right, you will see that if you find the right research content and you really put your work into, uh, for example, you know, taking a typical device like the mobile phone, which we all see where Apple, what Apple did with the iPhone, where they spent millions and millions of dollars in design, but you see the outcome on the other end where they're making billions of dollars to uh, in Apple and Apple stocks going crazy. Right? So it's really design is taking the right people and putting them in the right direction. That's the way I truly see it, right? Uh, without design, you will always tend to go in the wrong uh, direction and always move in uh, non-calculative manners, right? So a few case studies, I think you all, I think everybody here would know. One is typically the iPhone. Second is the vacuum cleaner. I mean, if you can guess what I'm talking about, it's Dyson, right? If you look at the industry for the past 10 years, uh, vacuum cleaners has been just a vacuum cleaner. There was a utility at the end of the day. By Dyson coming in, the first thing he did was research, right? He came in, he got his team together, before he even built the product, he spent days and days and days is deep research, talking to people, understanding what the market wants and launching the product quickly as possible to get that. If you looked into his, some of his studies that he did, uh, one of the first things he did when he came out was launch the product as quickly as possible and got his patent out in the market so that no one can copy, copy his product. So... The misconception that we always have is that design never equals sales, but design at the end of the day is sales uh, when, when we see the bigger picture of things, right? When you have good design and you have good branding or whatever it is, you see sales really shooting up the truth. And even though you might have an amazing product idea, but you don't have the right design skills to execute that product, you tend to see 
people blaming products as the issue rather than their skill to execute. So I truly think that the word design and design as a whole requires a rebranding. And us today here in the team can, you know, be be the people who really takes design to the next level and, you know, change our mindset on how we view uh, design when it comes to the bigger picture of building a product. So to really understand, you know, uh, how we can utilize design as a tool to, to, to launch our product and execute, we need to understand how it affects time and money when it comes to the business, business sense of thing, right? So let's go back to basics. Um, to really get execution right through utilizing design methodologies or, you know, uh, I think we have few service designers here as well and few researchers here as well. Uh, how do you utilize uh, your research skills, your product uh, development skills? Uh, one, I think normal thing is always set a hard limit early. We, we might always get into this loop where we get stuck in con consistently improving, which I agree, there's always uh, room for improvement. But setting a hard limit early on with a goal to that you, you have uh, placed with your fellow counterparts is something that you need to do from day one. Because this goal will let you set a limit and give you a date to actually launch your product and not get in that constant loop of you know waiting to improve, redesign, improve, redesign, and you never launch and you'll get late to the game. Next is to really understand the sales goal. Uh, most of the time when I see designers, one of the biggest questions they ask is how do I work with developers or how do I work with uh, these people? But I think that's a wrong question to ask from day one. Your first question should be asking how do I work with the sales team? Because your, your, your roadmap for design does not come from how well your developers, developers can code or how uh, beautiful the product is going to look like. But it's really decide, uh, between what is the sales goal? What is going to bring the company money? Because that will allow the company to really invest more into design and scale the product in that way. So the first thing when you design a new product or even start a new startup is really to get the stakeholders into account beyond just the, you know, just the market. Talk to your CEOs, talk to your CROs, talk to the guys that are actually on the ground trying to sell your product. Because at the end of the day, the feedback that they get from selling your product is going to be invaluable to really, uh, uh, sorry, valuable to really bringing your product to the next level. And don't get distracted by other limitations. A lot of times when we build a product, we get distracted by limitations like, oh, technology does not have this feature or operations does not, I can't catch up with what I'm trying to do. So I can't include it in my design. So I would really think of changing the mindset when it comes to building your next product, right? Look at things that affect the cost and the money of the product rather than the, small, the, the elements that affect operations and technology. Usually technology is the last step of the entire chain. Focus on growing the sales portion first, right? And next is, uh, is really what I want to talk about right here, right? Is reiteration versus fine tuning. This is where I see the, the biggest factor comes in, right? Beyond uh, setting hard limits, talking to your sales goal. How do you differentiate when should you launch versus when should I stop designing and, and, and let the product grow? So actually, before I, you know, I, I get into that topic about reiteration and fine-tuning, uh, fine I just want to ask a simple question from the audience to see if you guys understand uh, some of the terminologies that I'm going to be using. So Kaizen, right? It, it is a concept out there that I want to know if anyone, you know, understand what Kaizen is or have heard Kaizen before. And if you have, please put it in the chat or, you know, voice it out if you can. I, 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 tell me. Yeah, I think that's a, I think someone might give you a gift maybe for the next session. I don't know. You might get a discount for one of their workshops, probably. C, D, C, D, C, C, D. Okay, I'm getting a lot of... As, uh, someone from Redesign People can help me compute the answer. Yeah. Who's the majority? I see a lot of Ds. I think, I think D is the majority. D is the majority. Okay, cool. Five people chose C. All right, nice. I'm surprised nobody chose B. 
All right, all right, nice. Okay, majority of you, unfortunately, are not going to get the discount for the next workshop. Uh, but the answer is C. So it is an approach of thinking, actually, that there's always a, a, a room for improvement, right? So Kaizen is always, uh, it's a concept, it's an idea, basically, that the product, there's no such thing as perfection. There's always room for improvement. And I think as, as designers and as people who get into their own trade, they, we always aim for perfection. We always aim for the best. And I, I think that's, a, that's true. I, I think if they really, Howard or someone does a research, they'll think most designers have OCD because I think we always aim for some level of improvement or perfection. And this is what we see. So I think as designers and you know, as, as product developers or people who innovate, we need to remember that perfection is never going to be something that you can achieve because people change, the world develops, and there's always improvement to be made. So with the concept of uh, Kaizen, we need to remember that, you know, it's, it's good to launch when you think you're ready to launch that show, but never wait too long to aim for, for perfection before you even, you know, you decide to launch. So what do I mean by that, right? So there's a, a, a significant differentiation between reiteration and, and fine tuning. When I say reiteration, it's the process of constantly improving. So taking the concept from Kaizen. And when you, when you think of that, it's more like, hey, let's launch the product first and improve as we go with market feedback, uh, you know, with what the audience is saying and how, how what people are thinking about it. And fine tuning, yes, is part of the process, but we always get hung up on this, this concept of fine tuning, right? Where we overthink what people want. We do market research, we do market, and we pre-build, but sometimes we overdo that. Everyone has a different opinion. Opinions keep coming, but when do you put that hard limit to stop that? And small things like having UX errors, having bugs are totally fine, right? There's no such thing as a bug-free or UX-free issue uh, uh, um, in any platform. And why I say that is, to be honest, if you are actually launching, if, if you launch and you're proud of your first launch, you're already too late for the market. Any startup that launches or any product that launches, you should never be proud of your first launch because your, pro, your first launch is really to be speed to the market, right? So get out to the market, get feedback. Uh, for people who are digitally savvy or I think uh, have worked on SaaS products, I think this concept of building in public or being naked in public uh, with your product is getting quite prominent in, prominent in today's world. Why is this so? It's because the first impressions don't count anymore in the internet days that we live in today, right? So people are used to seeing products that are bare bone, that don't do much, but aims for an objective with a goal, message, and outcome. And the audience or you know the netizens of the world be it Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you get your audience from, will be with you on that right to help you improve your product. So if you have a product or you have a startup, it, I would suggest to you know launch as bare bones as possible, be as naked as you can, and just go public, right? Don't be embarrassed for it because what would happen, what you will see is the people understand what you're trying to do. You want to get the first market traction. And very quickly, as you're building, be very public about what you're building, right? Share it with the world. Uh, share your concepts with the world. Because at the end of the day, ideas are cheap, but execution is truly the value. And if you can execute with the public as you scale, you truly see this. Uh, uh, you'll see your product getting a lot better uh, as, you, uh, as you grow. So focus on the small changes rather than one big change at a time. If you are planning to build a SaaS product, so this is very prominent in the SaaS world. If you're planning to bring a, a SaaS product, uh, I mean, this, this trend built in public is very popular on Twitter and Reddit. I mean, if you search the hashtag, you'll see a lot of product companies, a lot of startups building in public. So do check it out. If you want to know a bit more about how you can build in public, uh, I think that's one of the questions we can talk a bit more at, towards the end. Um, next is have a flow, right? As you build a public in, in public, you need to have a good flow. Uh, without a good operations flow on how to improve or how to take feedback and improve quickly, your product is going to die anyway. Regardless if you take one year to build your product or your pro you're going to take one day to launch, you need to have a good flow to take in feedback and improve consistently as you get it. So if you plan to fail, 
uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So always have a reiter reiteration plan. And that, that's basically what I'm trying to say, right? Have a plan, take in feedback, and how do you fix those? So how do you reiterate effectively, right? So what I've gone through is talking about getting to an execution, using design to get to your execution. Now the question is, as you execute and you redesign your product and you build with the people, how do you build efficiently and how do you build effectively, right? One thing is to have a, a strong pipeline with your team. If you're, uh, you, I mean, in any company, you tend to have huge teams. You have your tech team, you have your sales team, you have your operations team, you have your QA testers, you have a bunch of different departments. Every company is slightly different in that sense. Um, the good thing to have is always to work and understand the flow, right? Get your key uh, stakeholders within the company and understand the entire operation flow. Uh, I've seen in companies where designers want to stay in their bubble where they're like, okay, I want to just know what's going on in my design. I've seen tech guys just do not want to talk to the design team. They just want to stay in their bubble. Sales will, sales will be like on a different floor and they won't even uh, come down on the floor to the tech side or design side, which I feel fine, you know, if you are a new designer or a new, a new employee in a business, take the effort, take the work to interact with people cross teams right i think that would truly help your career help your goals because one it brings you opportunity second it lets you understand each pipelines in different teams so that you yourself will better understand at which point in the pipeline can you receive feedback from different stakeholders not just the public within your team and improve that as part, part of your your reiteration flow second is have a strong operations flow so when i say operations i mean in any product we have operations when it comes to customer support or you know sending out deliveries or you know uh, replying to people uh, i would say that's the closest you can get to reaching out to your consumer right if you're a solo solo startup individual be the guy that is uh, on the ground interacting with your customers if you are a designer in a big bank ask for opportunities where you get to be on the ground with the operation staffs to understand consumer feedback right at the ground, right? So well, what I'm trying to say is that if you're new or as you're even, actually no matter where you are in your industry, you should always be annoying. Ask a lot of questions as a designer and as a, as a product developer or as a product uh, head, you should be the most annoying person in your team because you should be asking the most amount of questions. If you're not asking enough questions, you're, you're not learning enough to build your product, right? So always be annoying. Next is talk to your customers, join sales calls, you know, join tech stand-ups, join uh, a lot, as many places that you can get information from because customers might not flow information to you directly. They, it's, it's never, a feedback form is never accurate, right? A feedback form is a perception where you get one kind of information. Always talk uh, to different views and different people. Tech, tech guys, talk to your sales guys, talk to them about customer complaints from different perspectives. I think that's something that you can really truly help your product. And last, I would say is the most important actually is to have a clear goal and message. Because if you, if you launch a product very bare bone from day one, the most important thing is to focus on your goals and message. If you don't have a clear goal and message, no one will know how to help you. Even if the public wants to help you, they don't understand what you're trying to achieve and they can never help grow your product. And I understand that, you know, your goals and message change as you scale your product and it has to, right? Especially if it's a new product or something, it changes almost every other week. So I would suggest to use a framework. One of my favorite is actually the business canvas model. I'm sure some of you have heard of it. Uh, it's a very simple model that allows you to put certain focus points on this graph and it helps you narrow down your audience, your target audience and your marriage. So it's very quick because like my process, what I'm trying to suggest in my process is to reiterate quickly. And you need a framework that does not take one month for you to better to understand your product. It might take you a single day or a few hours to better understand your code message. Um, to give you a, a better understanding of the, of the business kind of forward, this is a simple, I would say, a template. If you guys want it, you can, it's on Miro. I think most of you should know Miro. Uh, you can go to this URL or I can send it in the, in, in the chat later on. Uh, it's a very simple template. It has, a, it has very simple explanations of, you know, what's your customer relations like, key proper, propositions, 
And the size of this is perfect, right? So you shouldn't be overfilling the business model canvas beyond the limit of the canvas. Then you're overthinking your product too much. Fill up the canvas. It will really help you narrow down uh, your goals, your opportunities, and the messages that you're going for to help reiterate the product. So that's generally the, you know, the, the bigger picture of what I wanted to give you guys when it comes to narrowing down your product uh, uh, and how you can reiterate quickly. Uh, that's basically, for me, the end of the topic. But you know, it's not the end of the session. So I wanted to focus more on the, the Q&A portion. If you guys have any concerns related to your business, your product, uh, let's see how we can help each other uh, in this conversation. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jovan, for the talk. I think it's very insightful. And I think I will say I really agree with what you mentioned. That is, ideas are cheap. But good execution is, you know, is, is something that is very of values. And it, it really shows on the teams whether they can execute the ideas or not. So... I think yeah. let's look at the Q&A. <clears throat> so we have one question from Vishnu, Vishnu actually. Yeah. And yeah, maybe Vishnu, uh, would you like to actually turn on your camera or, you know, your audio and ask the question directly if it's possible? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Um, hi, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi. Um, so, Yovan, uh, there was uh, one thing that you mentioned about... Mm. Uh, design directly talking to sales. Uh, so you, you, you're talking about this communication channel where design directly interact with sales such that, you know, you get like like this feedback, uh, this direct feedback from customers. I thought that was very interesting because I've, uh, I've never heard that in like in those specific words before. So I just wanted to understand like, how did you come to realize this? And how have you seen this actually play out in the real world as well? Um, I think what I realize it everywhere. Most guy, I mean, it's easier, a lot easier for me to see it because I work in a startup and you know teams tend to be small and that you know, reiteration processes tend to be very quick. So when I sit down with a team, you know, you just hear feedback instantly. Your sales team is it's not that big, right? You're a three, it's a three man team. I'm just sitting across the table from them and hearing hearing them complain consistently, and that's when I started realizing that you know I should be in those meetings. Like if I hear issues that I can give significant feedback on when it comes to product development, why am I not in that meeting? So you'll hear things like yeah, currently in my company, or they'll be like, oh, uh, we have two, we have three products. People are getting confused. Uh, how do I sell this? This we have three products that people are, they can't compare it equally. And their solution was, you know, oh, we have to sell better. We need to explain more. But actually, the problem was that we designed three products that were so similar that, you know, it's it was our job to kind of clean that up and combine it into a single product or two two significant products. So those kind of conversation would have been realized if you know because uh, the sales team couldn't get the opportunity to communicate with us. That's why I see as companies grow. Uh, more and more the communication channels get broken down. So it, 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 we have to make the effort to kind of clean that up and you know connect those doors together. So I truly really saw that in, in mostly the startup industry because it, it's small enough to realize that fast enough. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thanks, Ben. All right. Um, yeah, anyone? Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. All right, otherwise then I would like to ask my question to Jovan. <laughs> right, so you mentioned about how, you know, uh, designs can actually increase sales and it is, uh, it can be forecasted. So can you give some examples about that and maybe relating to uh, my own company? So how do I prove that, you know, my design actually has increased uh, the sales, for example? What's your company about? Maybe give me a bit of background <laughs> so I can Sorry, uh, your company, uh, my company. No, Sorry. yeah, well, you asked about your company, right? Okay, yeah, correct, correct. All right, so, so I think yeah. uh, for me is that right now I'm working in an agency. So clients will yeah. actually come uh, to us uh, and with their projects. So right now what we do is that, okay, we get the requirements and then we uh, execute a designs and develops the products. And mm. that's about it. So right now there's no some kind of metrics that we're tracking. So I guess uh, that's one issue also. Maybe, yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, suggestions? Yeah. 
Yeah, you no, know, I think that I think that's good. That's quite a significant point that you brought up. I think metrics is a very important thing. We track when you launch a company, you very quickly you will be like, yeah, I need to track KPIs, right? Mm. And the worst common KPI people track is how much revenue I'm making on my top line, what's my bottom line, and then you know, check their net profit. But nobody is check, and then they check how things like uh, a product feature roadmap correlates to your profit margins or uh. But nobody relates design directly to the correlation uh, to your profits. And that's something that we can very easily do, actually. And it, you know, it's widely available online. If you go to, for example, if you take, uh, like I was talking about iPhones, you can take iPhone at a certain date mark and you can talk about, you know, you take out some of the features and design elements that they have done because they published everything open, right? What they have designed. And you check just basically their profit line statement and versus what they have. Have, how they've iterated their designs over the years and look at how they've made. Those are the kind of research data that you can take, compile it efficiently and show your managers or your bosses and be like, hey, you can see that there are three different case studies that are doing this. We should aim to do this as well. And it's not being done today in, in today's industry very often, right? We see a lot of sales managers doing that for their products. We see a lot of people taking case other business case studies like Coca-Cola or you know, uh, uh, different brands and they're showing how profit margin relates to certain product launches. But nobody takes design feature launch uh, and, you know, research milestones and link it back to money. And I think that's something we all can start doing uh, in, in each of our own companies, right? Even if you're not the manager, if you're, you're just an you know, employee, do it for yourself. Track these things down because at some point over the over the next few months or next you can really take this and kind of showcase it to your managers or to your people to show them that the differences it, design can actually make uh in the long run especially right? yeah thanks for that i think it's also one way us as a designer to actually be proud of our work you know that that yeah. actually our work creates impact yeah no oh, very true all right. Uh, yeah. Um, anyone? Hi, hi. I have another question. Um, yeah, Radhika here. Maybe I just want to understand a little bit more about. Um, I think you were talking about public design, right? Um, yeah. Um, I was building just, in public. Yeah. Yeah, building public. So I was just thinking about um, when you're doing that. At what stage? I mean, if you're at such primary street stage and you're sharing your designs or what your ideas are, uh, there is possibility that your ideas can get stolen as well or somebody might copy it. Um, so maybe I just want to understand a little bit more about the building public concept and how do you sort of protect yourself from it as well? Yeah, so the, the, the idea of somebody copying your, uh, your, your, your idea is very, very rare. Uh, I've never really seen that in the in the industry at, at scale, right? Because even let's say you launch a very unique product that it's so so great that you know you're afraid that somebody wants to copy it. The moment you launch it, even one year later or whatever it is, there are going to always be companies and teams better than you that can launch it faster, <laughs> right? There's always going to be some engineer out there or some uh, you know guy sitting in, uh, that that can launch it ten x or ten times faster than you. And that's then your only differentiation factor becomes how well do you reiterate your product, right? To keep up with the market and keep up with the, the trends. As, and, and I can say that for any company, right? You look at the big companies like Airbnb, Apple, Facebook, all of them have competitors at some point. But why do these companies stay the powerhouse that they are today is because of the reiteration processes that they have built in-house. Uh, and, you know, so I, I would really truly suggest that you know don't worry about somebody stealing a product. Let them do it. Uh, let them steal the concept, the idea. Let them build it because it also acts as a way for you to compare and improve your product and learn from their mistakes. Because if there's no competitors joining your market, that means there's no market. <laughs> so, right. So it, it's a good thing that 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 a competitors coming into your market, even it's early days or late days, and and that's where you can prove your strength. Thank you. All right. I actually have one more question. <laughs> Sorry, I have a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you actually give us examples of um, you know, setting up hypotheses for the different outcomes? 
yeah so that's oh. one of the points that you mentioned so yeah i'm still very uh vague on how do we actually set up hypotheses yeah okay so uh you know when you launch a product we always want to i think we always try to find a, a market fit mm -hmm. so we do different tests in a market to understand it do our product have market fit for a certain industry for a certain, certain country or certain city whatever it is and how do we do that right so we would think we would set uh goals and opportunities like basically say okay if we hit 10k revenue in this city with this kind of marketing we will assume that we have market fit so that we can throw in more money to scale the product and really bring it to the next level so th then the question goes back to what are the different possible outcomes can i make that assumption at so setting a hypothesis it means that you have different goals. So it could be revenue focused. It could be users joining your, your platform. Uh, it could be, uh, for example, the number of uh, membership subscriptions that you have. So set different goals. So let's say if I have 10K subscriptions, I will do these things. If I have 5K subscriptions, I will do these things. So pre-plan all your possible, possible outcomes, not just the best outcomes, but prevent the worst outcome. What if I have one subscription? Mm -hmm what's my next pivot, right? Don't be afraid to pivot, but set that before you launch because when you launch, things get uh, scary, right? It get, you get emotional. You get like, I put so much effort into building this product. I did this, I did this. It, I can't kill my product now. I can't pivot. So set them before you get emotional. Always set your goal, set what you're going to do before you launch it so that when you launch it, you just go back to your book and be like, okay, I told myself, when I hit 10K, I'll do this and just do that. I told myself if my product has one subscribers, I will I will pivot into this uh this new market. Just follow that. Don't get emotional. Think before you, you, you actually learn. So that's what I mean by setting the hypothesis uh, uh beforehand. Got it, got it. Thank you so yeah. much. Right. Okay, so actually we do have uh another question also from uh Vishnu. Yep. <laughs> do you wanna voice out your question? Oh, you're eating right now. <laughs> Uh, I have McDonald's in my mouth, so <laughs> give me a second. Yeah. You're making me you're making me hungry. <laughs> you go get you should go get McDonald's as your treat then. <laughs> um yeah, so um I I'm I was I'm curious. Um um oh this talk about uh design iteration and how you are iterating in the public sphere. Could you share with us how you were able to do it uh, with Station? Because Station, it, I would imagine iteration with digital and physical products will be very different, right? It's it's not as easy for physical spaces and products. So oh, yeah. how were you able to um, carry out iterations with physical spaces in Station? And like, for example, like what was your current iteration and how far have you come along? Okay, pretty cool. Uh, I like that question. I get the promote station a bit more. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, okay, so station, uh, we have both a physical and digital. So I think that's a perfect question. We do have physical co-working spaces and then we have a digital platform that kind of aggregates a bunch of different co-working spaces into our platform. So we face both of those problems, uh, thankfully. So I can answer both questions. Um, when it comes to physical center, yes, it's a lot harder for sure because you know a, you, you're it's a physical asset you've paid millions for that asset it's, it's going to be difficult for you to iterate on on a physical center so the same way i would say how kickstarter builds a hardware product right why do you need to build the hardware first you can build the prototype you can build the concepts you can build the walkthroughs uh 3d walkthroughs so that's how we started first we we found a bunch of like uh this cheap 3D software and we did mini prototyping. We launched it first at the market. So we let people experience the walkthroughs, give us their complaints, talk about whatever issues they have. Um, we took that, we kept reiterating the 3D walkthrough and people, and we just give what we, what we promised them is like, we'll give you a free membership the moment you join us, right? Whoever's helping us at it. And they're more than happy because in the hopes that, that they're going to get the memberships, like to stake it. So they kept, we had like 20 people almost consistently giving us feedback uh, just for one 3D model. So after we did that, when we launched the space, our first space that we launched, we didn't even have enough chairs and tables for people to come and sit in where we launched. Uh, the reason for that is because we didn't, we were too scared to order, over order the type of table, type of chair. So we ordered very minimum 
and so that we can get feedback very quickly and buy the next set of chairs. So actually it did help. So we bought chairs that were that the backrest couldn't kind of like go back and we and we no, you can't find that online. You won't know that the chairs can't go back to that extent. So like one or two users complained about that. So then we just switched out the chairs because it was cheap for us, cheap enough for us to kind of reiterate. Uh, but I, I know uh, there are moments that we can't and that's when our solution minds have to come in. So how can we take with what we have and how can we improve it, right? Uh, as fast as we can. So spend the least, launch the most uh, and try to get it out as fast as possible. Actually, our co-working space is not the best example. I've seen these other guys called Hype. I don't know if you've heard of them. Uh, they're in Singapore as well. Uh, very interesting date. When they started out, I knew them when they started out, it was really bare bones. Like you can see the wirings and you can see the, it's literally just tables and chairs. So they started the concept with like just tables, chairs, you know, lighting, and then they just improved based on feedback. Somebody asked they wanted cafes, they built a cafe. So they really did it uh, really slow. So I think that's something you can all try also when it comes to hardware product. But yes, the cost is always a bit more higher there. So yeah. Uh, did, do you want to know about digital or <laughs> as well? I think digital is a, a lot more simpler. So it, the cost is a lot lower. So I think that basically is the whole, uh, the built-in public concept for digital. Yeah. All right, great. Um, I hope, yeah. Uh, I hope that answers your questions, Vishnu. Right, great, awesome. Yes, yeah, now uh, I'll just go to the last questions by Rishikesh. Uh, yeah, so Rishikesh, maybe you want to unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, hey, so uh, my question was uh, related to uh, how we actually define our operations flow. Does it really mean uh, the whole journey from where the user gets to know about your product till the point where the user has starting has started using the product and now are you know asking for more features? So what does it mean exactly? Sorry, I missed out the first part of the question. It got like cut off. Okay, I'll repeat again. Yeah, sorry. Man. Yeah, I wanted to know about more about the operations, uh, operation flow that you mm. mentioned about that how it affects, uh, your feedback as well. So can you like deep deep dive more onto this? Okay. So um, in in the operations flow, the way I see what operations flow mean is a lot of time it tends to be the customer support or you know the the last mile services right at the end of your entire flow where you deliver the product or you you know. Uh, get it on the ground or people are using it, customer feedback, all those kind of stuff. So the way I define that flow, a lot of the time, people put the least effort in that when they launch a product because, you know, it's just, I need to get the product out. I agree, get the product out as fast as possible, but have an efficient enough operation flow, meaning have a live chat. If you're building a digital product, have a live chat on your platform. Uh, be active on that live chat, right? It communicates directly to you, the founder, the product owner. Don't don't go through a, a, a customer service rep, right? You should be replying. You should be the customer service rep maybe for like a week, especially when you just launched the product. You know, uh, understand their complaints, understand their problem, understand their journeys that they have gone through because that truly will help you. So simple things like having live chat, having access to forms, uh, having the ability at any step of the process to uh, get your product, uh, get feedback on your product would be great. I use, I mean, for the, the some of the techies out there, uh, if you're building a website, I use this thing called Microsoft Clarity. I love it because what they do is it literally records every step of the user's flow uh, from the get-go and it's free. It's 100% free. It kind of records every mouse button and all. It gives you like a visual flow. So use tools like that to help you as much as possible. And also, let's say the user has no problems, for example, you should be chasing the user for problems, right? They book, you bought your membership, they bought, let's say, your coffee subscription from your website, and now you want, and they have no complaints, you should be trying to get complaints out of them because a lot of users in Asia are silent users, right? They don't, they don't complain, they just, you know, they, they, they just ignore, they might drop off later consistently communicate with your user and communicate to them as the product owner and not uh, as a customer service rep, right? Because that's what truly really makes them feel appreciated and also, you know, really kind of get back to you. So having a strong operations flow is, is that's what I mean. But when you scale a company, uh, obviously you'll have customer reps and all. So when you train your customer reps or you train your product, uh, 
uh, whoever is managing your product on the ground, they need to think like a product designer, right? They can't just be thinking as a last mile operator. So having checking in, having customer feedback is something that's also their job to report back into the company as the company scales so that you can really improve on those things uh, at any moment. Right? Like, I mean, if you get a food delivery right now from any of the services that you guys use, when they drop off the food, do they ask you any questions? Like, you're just asking how, how long, you know, people hate filling up surveys, but the guy who's delivering it to you could just ask you a question as they deliver it to you, right? And that itself is cheap, quick feedback. <laughs> like, you know, uh, which could very easily be fought back into the main company to get get the answers. So stuff like that can really help. Got it. Wow. Okay. Uh, does that answer your questions, Mukesh? Yeah. Like, thank you for answering because like, if, if I give some context, I was actually working on this particular part only because we're just about to, you can say, onboard our first beta customers and uh, like actually test our assumptions uh, right now. Right. So, we do have some picture in our hand, but we know that there are a lot of things that we still don't know. So yeah, I think that gives a good clarity. Thank you. Great. great. Well, what's your, what's your product? You want to share the website for everyone to uh, help you out? Uh, maybe not. Uh, yeah, I can still share. Uh, yeah. Because uh, the, the operation public. Is, uh, sorry? In public. <laughs> <laughs> like if we know that the target customers are, are in a particular area, a particular location, and there are products like Gmail, right? You can sign up and start using the product. But like you mentioned, there are products where uh, the customer success managers are assigned because the onboarding is not self-servicing or not automatic. So it's, it's more like a, a simple fintech product, very similar to Stripe, if you have heard. So, but we're targeting a, a particular niche out there, but I'll drop the website here. Yeah, sounds pretty cool. Yeah, send yeah. it, send it. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the answer. So, um, Rohan has a question. Am I correct to say that? Yes, uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, so I had a question about the product. Uh, currently we are thinking of launching and kind of working on, I'm working on right now. Uh, basically, what I'm working on is uh, it, it's, it's, it's in, in the sports industry. So as we are operational in Delhi and CR at the moment, the product what we are thinking of is um, most of the people who are moving on to the Delhi and CR, I mean, like being professionals or being students or something, those are looking for playing partners mostly and places to play the sports they like to play. Uh, the sports which we are right now working on are racket sports, mostly badminton, table tennis, uh, lawn tennis, these sports we provide. So what we are thinking of is we are trying to build a membership model where we'll be mostly thinking of creating a community of people who are looking for partners to play around with, I mean, like to, to, to play the sport they want to. Um, and as well as, I mean, like in a model where they uh, be some front some type of a subscription fee or something and then they get an access to that sport for some a designated period of time for the next three months maybe six months or something like that mm. so my question was um what would be your initial uh, thought of it what would be your initial plan while designing it what would what would you think as an user what are you looking for exactly like, how would you go ahead just i'm mean, like you know like in the blueprinting phase it is as of now yeah, so I'm just trying to grab some ideas and thoughts around how would you plan it through. So, you know, that's a very interesting. Uh, I would say product and also question. Um, what it seems like you're building is some form of aggregator of like sports uh, locations that people can oh. play with, right? And uh, not really aggregator. Basically, we do have okay. multi sports arenas already in Delhi. I mean, like almost seven to eight multi sports academies and arenas where. Oh, nice. like, okay. And adults can take coaching and then they can play as well. Okay. We have seven to eight sports in each of these arenas. So I'm, I'm, I'm the senior manager of all these, this whole daily operations at the moment and looking after the product part of the company as well. So mm -hmm. that's what we're thinking right now. Okay. Football is already, football and cricket is something which is already like people are very much aware about and people are playing. But racket sports is something people are really 
finding it hard to find partners to play along with mostly lawn tennis what mm-hmm. i really found a sport which is not really easy to master you need to be really really properly trained in order to hold a racket and play for maybe like even 15 minutes it's pretty hard and, and even harder to find a partner around so uh, how would you go ahead with this membership model what do you think should be the perks uh, what should be the perks for a user uh, in order to take up this membership i think it's a pretty model. pretty cool concept i mean okay first step i would what i would do is take the competitors in the market and i know there are few there's a there's this app that i use to to find people to play tennis i mean i never play tennis i just have the app uh initially so then i think the way they, they connect people and any kind of even let you book a location like it's an all in one kind of thing right you book the location you find the people to play with you come and you play and you go then they have a fee so you understand their business models basically right how they work first my suggestion is just replicate what they did first very quickly launch it and then understand your market audience because racket playing might be very different from people who play soccer they are they are payment tiers uh the affordability is their background you know uh might be very different how much are they willing to pay to find another person to play with might be very different from like what you say soccer is very easy right but i'm fine so they might not be willing to pay as much right. um i would I mean, what the model is suggested it seems very much of a freemium model like i would rather give it free first and then charge uh, mm-hmm. for certain tiers uh after a while maybe you get to find once a week but generally the flow is launch first doesn't matter it's free it's paid launch first put like put a logo there that we are in a bit we're in a bet beta stage things might change just make it clear that you know you're very early in the days launch it get it out get your feedback and very quickly iterate your price plan because your price plans are the your barrier of entry right to the market right. market right. for this product um you want to make money so is subscription good or is it more like a pay per use model should i pay for every time i want to use it i uh, need to understand your customer frequencies mm-hmm. how often do they going to book it uh are they going to book it once a week once a month if it's once a month would i need a plus why why would i pay for a subscription those are questions you need to answer and it's going to be very painful for you to do research now because nobody can see the product and give you right. the answers right. i think it makes more sense you launch it let people use it and then you use that answers to kind of change and update or even rebuild your entire product from scratch because now you got the answers and those answers you might think it's you know it's not worth building a product to get those answers but trust me the cost of those answers is so expensive it's it's worth it to build your product first and get your answers as quickly as possible right so your idea is great now the question is where's the market at right and so do you think uh, putting up a finishing line to it i mean like uh, as a as as a semi pro athlete or an amateur athlete you might be looking mm-hmm. for something as a fish, finishing line right i mean like if you think i'm like i have started playing lawn tennis today maybe 3 months down the line if i take part in a tournament i might I mean, like win a silverware or something do you think keeping that in mind something like if you take this membership you are joining up for a tournament or something which will have like 6 months or something can really lure more interest from the users i think so but the question is how many people because if your mass if your app your app is more mass market right how many people are actually going to reach there uh, and then that's the question mm-hmm. right so is it majority is that your goal so you can do that at some point for the the more niche audience because they will i i call them the whales right they, they are the ones that kind of like fund your app in the long run so uh yeah it, it makes sense to do that but not when you launch so that that membership feature they're talking about is not something you should do when you launch launch mm-hmm. first uh get the the tier one feedback and then then you start mm-hmm. getting your, your niche customers and then you follow the money trail to to kind mm-hmm. of like uh launch a niche product slowly yeah yeah because at the moment you launch i'm pretty sure two other guys also will launch out the same thing as you then your right. question is how do you how do you beat that those guys uh in the market i i don't fully understand your market yet so but generally you know people there would i and i assume would try to compete with you uh at certain extent so you need to right. beat them and the best way to do it is do it faster than them right <clears throat> right time is everything <laughs> thanks man. yeah all right Great. that was a good discussion <laughs> back and forth all right then uh, actually we've come to the end of our uh, talk and yeah so before we dismiss everyone it will be great if everyone could actually turn on your camera 
and we would take photos 